this is Nam from Easy Sunday Club. And it's Kathy. And today we're going to take you through uh, some twists and turns into Kathy's business. Yeah, yeah. so this is going to be a, a longer video, kind of in a podcast form. We're going to have a conversation about the evolution of Easy Sunday Club from when I first started it in 2016. And you're here to kind of guide through the conversation so it's not me a talking head for however long, <laughs> many minutes this is going to last. And because you're here from the beginning, so you know the right questions to ask at different pivotal points. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> so um, this, this, uh, the way that we're going to break up this conversation is that this company has been around for about five years, 2016 to 2020. So we're going to um, go through each year. Uh, I'm going to ask Kathy what the revenue streams were for that year. And if um, there's any additions or subtractions, going to ask her and, and delve in of, of why that occurred. And the purpose of making this video is to hopefully give you some ideas about any changes you want to make with your art business or if you're in the beginning, give you some encouragement and validate that uh, art business can go through a lot of different changes over as little as two to three years, as you'll see. So yeah, we just kind of want you to have a peace of mind that if you're at a point where you're confused and not knowing what to do next, like there's obviously a lot of different options, but it's okay to change even if you've already gone down one route for a while. Check our other video about everything leading up to the point where I left my STEM corporate job to pursue an art business. I didn't have an art background, so I self-taught and six, seven months later, decided to quit that job to um, pursue art. So if that sounds interesting to you, make sure to watch that one over this. And we would love an early thumb up if you like what you hear so far. Cool. So right, let's, let's get, get into, into it. it. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go into the first year of the business in 2016. Um, you had just quit your job. Uh, we were trying to get married or prepping to get married. Um, what were your revenue streams for this business at that point when you had just quit your job? Yeah, so right after I quit my job, um, for the rest of 2016, my main revenue came from commissions, so doing custom art for people, selling art prints and originals. I sold them exclusively online at the time. Uh, I think I went to like one small art show, but like I said, 80% of my sales that year was from doing custom art. So yeah, it's, I quickly realized that it wasn't sustainable, but we'll talk about that later. Like I said, I didn't do any like, wholesale. I didn't do licensing. Um, it was basically selling prints and customs. Even though I left my full-time job, I picked up freelance work almost right away uh, because I was too scared not to when the opportunity came. So um, I still had that as a, an additional more stable income at the time to kind of help support me through a lot of the ups and downs in the beginning. Yeah, so it wasn't... And so you're not too freaked out about us losing half of our household income all of a sudden. Yeah. After I bamboozled I a, you into yeah. marrying me. Yeah, because I had such a big burden on, 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 on my, on yeah, my shoulders trying to, to support our artist. household. <laughs> that being said, since you were just starting off and the business was still growing... Um, do you recommend people to have a main source of income or job or consulting or freelance? A hundred percent yes is the most simple answer. Uh, and, and also depends on, you know, a lot of other factors like where you are in life stage. Like when we make that decision, we had already bought a house. We had mortgage to pay for. Uh, we were, you know, wanted to start a family in the near future. We're both in our early 30s or close to mid 30. So to me, I like it was important to have savings and still to have consistent income. But if, you know, I was 21 by myself, like renting a room in a house or something, then maybe I would be able to take a lot more risk and just do it full time or, you know, take up a bartending job <laughs> or something. Right. So yeah. yeah, it's a nuanced question, but for the most part, I would say, yes, it is perfectly acceptable and recommended to have another job um, that isn't like creatively soul-sucking that can give you the fuel to work on the creative business. Moving on to 2017, uh, that was the second year uh, of your business. 
uh, what revenue streams did you add that year? In 2017, I added licensing to my income stream. I found two different opportunities. One was from just sending a cold emails to different companies that I found online that sold nursery art because my art was geared towards like kids and baby rooms. I did that. One of them got back to me. They're still a licensing partner today. The other one was through a friend of a friend's relative or something. And they that licensing partnership actually eventually got me in like home goods bed bath and beyond and even like target online which is great but no it took over two three years to get there and if you're interested about licensing we have a basic cover <laughs> we have a basic video about that this video is going to be like upselling all of our other videos because <laughs> we talked about so many different things uh, we have a video about licensing and my experience there at a high level. Yeah, as, from a product perspective, um, what, was anything added to the portfolio? Uh, prints, um, pins, anything like that? Yeah, and just to clarify, licensing, the work that I licensed were work that I already made, but I had consistently produced new work throughout the year as well. So the, the other big milestone that I reached in 2017 was I started producing baby blankets like the one you see behind me here and that's from a collection that i made it was like alphabet wild animals i share different like conservation facts with my audience on instagram as i painted each one and it i mean without getting too much detail it kind of one thing led to another it was an intuitive decision to turn it into a baby product and a baby blanket to be specific so at the end of 2017 I released a blanket in small batch and it was sold out and that sort of propelled like a whole other revenue stream in terms of like a new product that I could sell. So in 2017, we started making pins and blankets, which we had yeah. to rely on outside manufacturer. Yeah. Everything up until that point was all in-house. Mm -hmm. We would print and make our own prints Correct. and original art in-house. So yeah. this is the first time we actually had to start to rely on other partners and people and that added a different dynamic. Yeah, it was uncomfortable to rely on an external partner, especially ones that are like overseas and to work with products that I didn't work on before to have my art printed on different surfaces. That was a learning curve too. Um, but I felt like I needed to expand beyond paper goods. And it wasn't so much of like, I run the numbers and realized like it doesn't make sense. It was just part of it's just chasing my curiosity. And also, like I said, with the baby blanket, it made sense with the market that I was already in to get into that. And like I said, I was interested in learning about the entire process of making that happen. So in 2017, um, you added blankets and pins. Uh, was there anything that you took away? Yes. Uh, so even though commission was the bulk of my sales or revenue in 2016, by the end of 2017, I had reached burnout in December that um, I decided to stop commission altogether, or at least by early 2018. because. December 2017 was my best month yet. Like I was the first time I broke five figures that month in gross revenue from my art business. And I mean, my art business and I did some freelancing too, but I took on like seven commission projects from people because that time of the year, people wanted like custom work as gifts for their friends and family. Um, I released a baby blanket, so it was selling well during the holiday. Uh, I just and we did, I think, two holiday fairs too, right? So that required us to be there in person and selling. So by the end of it, I was definitely burnt out between all the commission and selling and making new work. I just intuitively knew that commission was was the thing that needed to go, because. Even though at the time I knew what I wasn't pricing my commission fairly, like I could have priced it at double the price. It really, I, like you remember this about me too, like you witnessed it, the stress and the pressure I put on myself when I was creating these work individually for individuals. Like, I don't know what price would make it 
worth it. And even if I can price my commission that time, 10 times the, what I charged, it just wasn't worth it for me. It wasn't worth it for my sanity. I think I enjoy like product development of one piece of work and like repurpose repurposing it to different places yeah more Ka than um setting. kathy's not at the point where she can just make a piece of art and give it to someone and say hey this is what i made you take it or leave take it take it or um, leave it yeah kathy's very uh client focused and whenever <laughs> she someone is entrusting her with their money uh to paint something like a cat or a dog or it's usually a subject that's very personal to the client. Mm -hmm. Kathy puts a lot of pressure on herself to deliver. So each one of her commissions and even her normal paintings, she'll do two, three, four times or whatever it takes. So not only was the amount of money she was getting paid, she was doing, she was putting like two X, three X times the work into it. Um, by the time she's done, we can't repurpose that painting for anything else. Yeah. It's, it's a, a shih tzu or it's yeah. a chihuahua and it's just a one-off uh, painting that's based on someone's uh, picture of that dog and we can't use it for anything else whereas when Kathy's making her own art um, there's not the same amount of pressure because she's doing it for quote-unquote fun or she is the client she's making it for herself so there's not as much pressure and then there's a long life, long tail after the art is done for, for Kathy to repurpose it to other products. Yeah, knowing that there are people out there who like my style of art, I'd rather make something first and find those people than to have someone come to me already and make that thing for them. Like to me, in long term, it doesn't make sense. It can be like a small portion of my total sales but like i said it just wasn't a personality fit and i know artists who love doing commissions like that's all they do and they like that it's a one-time transaction and they get to be you know they get to learn about the story behind the inspiration and they get to meet all these families who are really sweet because they're making these things for their loved ones right and i enjoy that too but ultimately it just wasn't the right fit for me and I guess that'll take us to 2018. So yeah. I guess in 2018, you did away with your commissions um, and then you had your paper goods still. You mm -hmm. had your enamel pins and you had your blankets. Any other changes um, that came with you in, in year three of the, the business? Yeah, in 2018, I also started doing pursuing wholesale a lot more. I think I dabbled on it in 2017. So I started to try to... So I started growing wholesale locally, which basically means I went to different stores. We were in Portland at the time, so I went to different stores or emailed them and asked if they would consider carrying my art prints at their stores. And Portland's a very supportive community when it comes to like creatives and artisans and makers. So I had some luck with it. Um, I think I had maybe one store that carried my work by end of 2017, but 2018, I wanted to double down on it. What I liked about wholesale is even though you are usually typically selling these your products at half the price that you would sell to like a regular consumer, it's like wholesale pricing standards, you're selling it in bulk. So a store could be buying like 30 prints from me at half the retail price so that they can then mark it up and sell it to the end consumer. It is a more bulky transaction and I still get to for and I still get to forge relationships with these wholesalers yeah, so I and, felt like it kind of met like a couple of my interest points yeah and then also the retailer has their own type of audience and um, clientele so mm -hmm. then it allows your work to be introduced to that clientele and yeah. continue to grow its reach yes that's a that's a great point because a lot of those customers they'll never find me on Pinterest or Instagram or Facebook or whatever places I am online. But if they have, you know, they live in a neighborhood and they visit those shops often, they have a relationship directly with the owner. And if the owner can be an advocate for my work, then they are an extension of my sales team, really. Yeah. So I think that relationship is definitely worth it. And, you know, I still have retailers that have become my friends yeah and it feels like a partnership because like mm -hmm. they only want to sell hot products to their clients yeah. 
Yeah. So if they don't identify and their clients depend on them to be kind of a tastemaker. Yeah. So if they find something that will help their sales grow, like, um, you know, our products, then they will push that and, and advocate for us. So it's, yeah. It, it, and they give us that feedback too. Like, yeah. Hey, you're this, this print is doing really well. This wool print's doing really well. So I can kind of gives me an idea to make something similar to it. Or maybe it's like a regional preference, like this, you know, Pacific Northwest, they really like woodland animals, but maybe someone in Florida, a store in Florida sells more whales. So yeah. I can, it start to help me kind of niche, not niche down, like target different areas, different um, pieces of my work. Yeah, um, in 2018, I remember it being a pretty stressful year for you just because uh, you were pregnant. <laughs> yeah, I had a baby yeah, all you had by a baby, myself. But just... <laughs> specifically in the first quarter of the year, we were invo involved with uh, wire fraud over our blankets with our old manufacturer. So yeah. we had to work through probably the most stressful period for your business um, up to that point and since, yeah. knock, knock on wood. But yeah. um, can you kind of take us through that journey of having to deal with a couple thousand dollar loss while you're pregnant and trying to manage a business while a new business is growing inside you. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. I guess we can't avoid it, right? Because for an entire 2018, I was either pregnant or like bound to a newborn 24-7. Yeah, no, no <laughs> yeah, yeah I was factory. in a mill factory. made a card out of it. Yeah. I mean, I made a card from that concept. Um, early, yeah, early 2018, I was working with my manufacturer that made the first batch of baby blankets on a reorder. You know, I've never met them before. I found them on Alibaba and we took the transaction off Alibaba, much to my regret because I thought, hey, we made it work the first time. I should trust them, right? But no, I wanted to increase my order the second time around. They took my deposit and didn't want to produce the rest of the products. They were asking for a full payment for some reason, made up different excuse about how they have like financial issues. And at the end of it, I lost my deposit, which was a few grand. And it was a significant amount of money at the time. Um, I kept thinking to myself, like how many prints <laughs> would I have to sell to make back that money? It was painful. And it was my first trimester. I was nauseous all day long. Sometimes I couldn't even look at the phone. So it was just, it, yeah, it definitely, it was probably the lowest point in my business. Yeah. But well, what did you uh, learn from that? I learned not to trust strangers on the internet too much, <laughs> even after already paying them. <laughs> well, I think one of the themes that you'll find um, that, that I come from listening to these stories is that when you're in absolute misery, either in at your job or from your relationship, mm -hmm. it forces you to make a change. So mm -hmm. for us, um, the positive that came out of this was that we were able to um, reach out to a family friend mm -hmm. who was a manufacturer of blankets, surprisingly enough, and ask for help. Mm -hmm. um, we had a problem doing that before that. We didn't want to ask for help. We wanted to do it all on our own, but then we were able to reach out and find a new manufacturing um, partner. And it's not perfect. Nothing is, mm -hmm. but you know um, that human to human contact relationship and trust is so important uh, from not only your retailers but also from your manufacturers mm -hmm. and now we have a pretty good relationship with our new manufacturer and, and making blankets yeah and the challenge i went through from this manufacturing process like greatly exceeds what i went through was commission right yet it was relatively easier for me to give up doing commissions whereas with the blankets i still wanted to keep going i think another thing to look at is just as you try different things with your business you'll notice that you're better at some things or you enjoy doing some things more than others and it's okay to not like to do something we don't like to do accounting so then we outsource the accounting so it, it, you don't have to be trapped doing something you don't like to do. You can figure out, identify what you don't like to do, operationalize it, and hand it off to somebody else. Yeah, a key point is I think you should do it yourself first. Try to do it yourself. Maybe accept accounting because they're definitely professionals. But you know, sometimes you're not. You're on a tight budget. You can't outsource everything from the right off the bat. Nor do I recommend it. I think you should try to figure out 
how to do everything yourself. And then once you're comfortable, as you're hiring them out, at least you know how to assess if that person is the right fit for you. Otherwise, like, how would you be able to evaluate their performance if yeah. you don't even know how to do the thing? Right? Yeah. Um, so that was 2018. By the end of 2018, you had a kid. And then we were going into 2019. Yeah. So what was it like then having to try to manage a business now that you are uh, a new mom? Yeah, going into 2019, you know, just I continue to try to survive as a mom of a newborn and a business owner. Um, I think I barely took maternity leave. And at the end of 2018, we also did quite a few holiday fairs 2018. So, you know, they say it takes a village, right? It takes a village to raise a kid and run a small business. So I remember we had to fly your parents up to Portland from LA to take care of our kid while we were going on these holiday fairs. Yeah, well, it, was our, it was our biggest it. holiday fair of the year. So we needed some sort of coverage. Yeah. Know? And my parents wanted to see our kid anyway. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but it was, um, it was almost like having two kids, right? Because the business is its own is, a, is an infant as well. Yeah. And then you have you have this kid that you have to be responsible for. Um, 2019 was, uh, remembered as kind of like a big transition year. Um, yeah, that's when us. we had to, um, move our business. So we, um, the result of having a kid was that we felt like we needed to be closer to family. Um, so we were living in Portland at the time and then we wanted to move back to LA so we can be closer to Kathy's parents as well as uh, my family. So, um, in the summer we started making plans to move and um we had to orchestrate this move and um you know sell our home and uh you know find a new place to live here and set up shop here instead of a set up a business here find child care yeah find, find child care it area. was uh, emotionally and physically exhausting and um also something i realized was like um i wasn't particularly a present dad like the the first year um because of all the changes and job changes and stuff like that um i i i wasn't you know <laughs> yeah so even though you're yeah. in a lot of my youtube videos actually you were you had a full-time job this whole time yeah yeah right and you still do now so it's yeah it's you had a lot on your plate you're stressed out about your job which you know, leading up to you leaving and us moving back, which was actually a good decision in retrospect, right? But it did like upend our life temporarily for a few months as we prepare for the interstate move to California. Yeah. Um, but the cool thing was that we were able to move here and then instantly with the family support and finding some stability, um, we we had like seasonal effectiveness disorder in Portland because of the lack of sunlight during fall. So going through the fall and winter here with much more sunlight um, gave us more energy, um, was able to focus on the kid more, focus on the family and able to um, work on some stuff with um, Easy Sunday Club, including helping to make some of the YouTube videos. Um, that was like super exciting. So yeah. I think when I look back at 2019, it's those changes and also adding the, the um, additional uh, source or, or the, the, the adding the additional channel of the YouTube channel. Yeah, which wasn't a source of income last in 2019 yet. Like we were just getting back on to making content more consistently in 2019. But in 2019, we had I had grown the wholesale um, to a bigger portion of my overall sales. Yeah, and I you know, removed commission. I had some licensing, although I kind of kept it on autopilot. Like licensing is not completely passive. You still have to nurture those relationships and create new work. So I didn't do much of that. I kind of left it alone. Online sales grew and we did a ton of fairs, like shit ton of fairs. You can buzz, beep that out. <laughs> I think we did six during the holiday just because we just moved back and you weren't working at the time. So you're like, hey, I'm here to help. Just sign up for as many as possible. Right? And we got burnt out from it, which timing wise actually worked out because this year we didn't sign up for any 
Yeah. And COVID happened, 2020, COVID happened. And I'm like, okay, I guess we're not doing fairs for a while. Yeah. So going to, segue, segueing into 2020, sure. what were some of the things that you were able to do during COVID? Yeah. So once we settled down in our new home and found like stable childcare, I became prolific with creating new work. Uh, 2020 did impact my wholesale a lot, especially since it was like 40% of my sales the previous year. But with e-commerce accelerating, everyone have no choice but to shop online. So my online sales has, you know, went up as well. So it kind of offset some of the wholesale. Um, I continue to make new work once I realized like, hey, my business isn't going to go completely underwater back in um, when shutdown first happened. So then I kind of recollected myself. I started experimenting with a new subject landscape and eventually turned that into a collection. I made of my first calendar out of it. So my 2021 calendar was just released. It was it launched pretty well. I made a second order and I'll start shipping them or I've started shipping them to stores as well. And I think that's another benefit to having wholesale partners too, that you have relationships with. Like I don't have a ton of wholesale stores. I know some of the bigger brands or even small brands have hundreds and hundreds. I only had at the peak, maybe 50, but then there's 10 of them that I'm close to. I like, we know each other by name and when I have a new product, I feel more comfortable going to these industry friends really to pitch them this new product. And they're more likely to give me a chance because they know that some of my other work already sell. Right? It's like to them, it's less hurdle than finding another, like getting email from another artist who happens to sell calendar, right? Because they already have my work there. Yeah. So if you were to look back at the, the last five years of the business and all of the, the changes and the pivots and the um, different channels that you were able to, to grow, what were, what were some lessons that you'd like to share? Yeah, and I only know what I know. Right? I wish more of these stories could be shared from other artists who have been around maybe even longer than me. And I don't know if the changes I've gone through are natural. I'd like to think it's natural process, natural part of evolution. Um, as a, for me, like I'm a relatively new creative. I didn't do creative work as a living. Um, I did go to business school. So sometimes I do things, think about things from a business perspective, but I think I'm an artist at heart. I'm a creative at heart. So sometimes I would say often I choose what's interesting and what I would enjoy and I have more passion for over something that is purely for economical scalability slash like revenue generating reasons. <laughs> um, and no, I could have gone all in on selling the blankets to as many stores as possible, trying to get into like Nordstrom's or whatnot. But I allowed myself or gave myself the room to explore different things. Like even with pins, even though in retrospect, it kind of didn't make sense for me to get into pins. Um, it was just an itch that I answered and I scratched and I don't regret doing that. Um, I think that part is relatable to like artist entrepreneurs over like the the more like typical entrepreneur where it's all about like scaling a business up to an exit or to like millions of dollars. It's that we are going to have shiny object syndrome. Some discipline is needed to move things forward. So you're not always exploring things, but we also have to give ourselves the room and space to explore our creativity. Otherwise this fire is going to burn out and it's not sustainable in the long run. So it's kind of like choosing between like staying curious and fueling that creative fire and like maybe pacing the growth or even slowing the growth on purpose. Yeah. Makes Does sense. that make sense? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you hope so. <laughs> doesn't matter if it makes sense to me. I hope so. Hopefully it makes sense to them. All right. Yeah. What was your takeaway from re recapping everything here? This is the first time we're doing it. 
Um, Actually, second time. <laughs> yeah, second or third time. <laughs> it's the second time. Because <laughs> we had logistical uh, uh, issues. We had creative differences. Yeah, creative differences and logistical, lo- logistical issues. Um, yeah, what was your takeaway? I think something that I would like to pass on along to the audience is some mottos that I go by. One is to fail fast. So it's okay to try different things, but if it doesn't work out, try to fail fast just so, so you can like move on. Don't waste too much time in it and uh, move on to the next thing. I think Kathy's good at that just because she does have a curious mind and she does like to dabble in different things, but she kind of checks her emotions and is introspective to see whether or not that thing that she's doing um, is something that brings her joy and happiness or if it's just uh, more trouble than when it's worth. So even if she's doing a calendar this year, um, she's evaluating that to see whether or not it's worth doing next year. And she won't just do it just to press the easy button. For pins, she just felt like, hey, um, they sold well, but it's just she doesn't feel that much joy and happiness doing it. So she's just putting a, a hold on it for now. So yeah, that's, whereas um, for yeah. the baby blankets, I'm still doubling down on it three years later. I didn't talk much about of it for 2020, but we're st- I, I'm still going to continue to sell it. I've actually just released the third version of it. And in going into 2021, like we'll have YouTube, which just became a new revenue source. We didn't talk about that earlier and yeah i'm exploring other things like online watercolor classes yep and And, yeah and that leads to the next thing is just like um you know you don't have to have everything figured out just take the next step kathy says that at the end of her videos (laughs) thanks for stealing my (laughs) punchline yeah so um you know i say progress over perfection but it's just basically we are all analytical and type A people, and I'm sure you, you know, the, the people out there watching are, are the same. So there's so many, so much calculus you can do, so many decisions you can make, so many things that you can try to plan out, but the important thing is action, like just taking the next step, continuing to push forward. Otherwise, um, if you wanted to get more additional information or get a second opinion, you can go, the internet is great for that, and it can actually keep you from taking action or making the next step, you know? Yeah. So that, that's another thing I wanted to point out. Yeah, that's a good way to wrap up this video. So thanks for joining us for this video. Uh, let us know what you think in the comments below. Uh, if you want to support us, go ahead, and, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And thanks for joining us. Thank you.